we recognise the need for a, a much wider, more diverse history and uh, with the support of the Social History Society and the Society for the Study of Labour History, where we sought funding to make a film about the contribution of uh, African Caribbean migrants to the National Health Service, two key features of post-war British history. Uh, they very uh, generously supported this film uh, and we're hoping to use it in teaching, to use it, uh, spread it around uh, to other history departments and to help to make uh, the history of Britain's uh, black and ethnic minority communities much more mainstream, much more a central part of what we teach, what we write about, uh, and the sorts of uh, history that we do uh, in schools and universities. So amongst the children of immigrants to Britain who had particularly distinguished careers in nursing, um, uh, one of the first who springs to mind is Elizabeth Anionwu, whose father uh, came to Britain in response to the British government's call for, um, for people to, to come from Africa to work in Britain. Um, so her father came from Nigeria and she was born in Birmingham. She was, she was a black nurse to have a very distinguished career. Um, and she went on in the later 20th century to, fa to help found the first specialist clinic, a pioneering clinic for patients with sickle cell anemia and thalassemia. Um, and that was a really important piece of work because a lot of people were suffering a great deal and, and indeed dying of those conditions in the mid to late 20th century. Um, and it was a condition that, of course, you know, particularly affected black people. So that pioneering work was very innovative. And she was she trained as a nurse and then as a specialist health visitor and then set up this very important pioneering clinic. Um, and she also campaigned absolutely tirelessly um, to have Mary Seacole recognised as, as a significant figure um, to, to be remembered in British history. Uh, Mary Seacole, of course, the, the black woman from Jamaica who uh, travelled to Britain and then travelled on uh, independently to the Crimea during the Crimean War to care for British soldiers on the battlefields and you know in her own hostel that she set up in the Crimea. So that there's that wonderful link between modern nurse Elizabeth Annie Onwu and uh, Victorian nurse Mary Seacole, where Annie Onwu campaigned um, to have Seacole recognised you know, as one of the significant figures, one of the emblematic figures in British nursing. How was the NHS formed? And what were the African Caribbean contribution to the construction and the formation of what the NHS means to the British nation and the world. The African Caribbean community in particular uh, arrived in Britain at basically the same time as the NHS and their histories are intertwined. Both of these two uh, uh, groups, both of these two uh, events in British history are very closely uh, aligned and the uh, Caribbean community bring into the NHS both the skill of a new and a vibrant group of workers and also uh, ensure that it is effective uh, in being able to deliver uh, the massively increased demand that uh, healthcare experiences uh, in the um, in the mid 40s, 50s and 60s uh, as the system uh, is first developing. The then MP Enoch Powell went to the Caribbean and invited many workers to come up to join this new flagship organisation called the NHS. So I think to see the NHS without appreciating the uh, contribution and the way in which uh, people of African uh, Caribbean communities uh, delivered uh, services uh, at all levels uh, to the NHS, I think would be a massive uh, injustice. And what they brought with them was a strong work, work ethics and a strong moral standing and good values. And they were the bedrock of the development of the NHS. I think we were uh, 
the African Caribbean community was pivotal in many ways. Um, one, um, the work it, it, Britain needed a workforce, and it needed a workforce in specific areas. In my case, it was nursing. Um, I had a penchant for uh, care. Uh, I'm a people's person, you know. Born in September, so I must have been a Virgo, so I must have that care of, care about me, and um, and so it was um, a natural place to, for me to be. So I applied to Poole General Hospital in Dorset for a student nurse's post. And what they did at the time, they sent my application back to Jamaica to the Ministry of Health in Kingston. And they called me for an interview. So I went for the interview and they questioned me from top to bottom. And one of the things that they said to me was, why didn't I want to be trained in Jamaica? Why do I want to come to England? And I said, when I go to England, I'll get an experience that I can bring back to Jamaica that I won't have if I'm trained here. Anyhow, I passed the interview and I was accepted as a student at Poole General Hospital in Dorset. So in 1961, I arrived here in England, not knowing what I was going to face. It was cold, the climate was different, the food was different, and after two weeks, I want to go back to Jamaica. There hasn't been a lot of research on this, but Snow and Jones's research does indicate that so they did some interviews with nurses, and those nurses did, their, their stories were, their narratives were of having been encouraged to come, thinking that they would be state registered nurses and finding that they were on a state enrolled nurse training. Um, said that, um, that narrative shouldn't be overstated. You know, a number of nurses um, moved to Britain, African nurses, Caribbean nurses, moved to Britain and did do the state registered nurse training. So there was there, there were many nurses on a range of different types of program and in a range of different types of roles. By 1969, um, these nurses accounted for about 25% of the nursing workforce. So they really were essential to keeping the NHS going and you know, keeping that service um, as effective as it was. The recruitment that I went through uh, started really from Barbados. Um, we were told about um, the life in the Caribbean, I mean, life in, the, in, in, in England. Um, and, well, the reality and, and, the, um, uh, and, and the not so glowing. Um, but when we got here, um, I think the, the recruitment that I went through um, first, I went directly into nursing, um, and I went directly into nurse training. Um, within three weeks of arrival, I was in the, in, in, in the training school. I did my training, finished qualification, and worked at the Huddersfield Royal Infirmary when it was at um, Poland, Poland Street. It was at Poland Street. And then they built a new hospital up in Linley and I would transfer from Huddersfield Royal Infirmary in town up to the one in Linley. Uh, within that three weeks though, uh, it took quite a bit of per persuading me to stay because of what I saw was hostility. You know, um, people didn't really, uh, didn't know how to treat me. Um, I was almost a, a stranger. In, the, in their mix. Racism was at the fibre of all areas in, of employment, in particular the NHS. My sister went into nursing and gave me a lot of anecdotes and experiences. Now back in the day some patients refused to be seen to or cared for by someone of African Caribbean background. You know, this, this was quite prevalent. You know, the, the, their co-workers, you know, would, from time to time, isolate them. 
very subtly. So the struggles they had was to work collectively and form strength within that. You know, their aspiration and their progress was hindered by racism. It was very subtle, but it was there. During my training, there were lots of things that I wasn't happy with. But I tell myself, you're here to be trained as a nurse, and that's what you must concentrate on. Forget about the mishaps. Forget a bit of some of the treatment that was dished out to me and keep progressing and get your qualification. And that's what I did. In the nursing area, the nursing hierarchy, I had friends who were nurses. But um, the attitude to the nursing staffing the officers was one of um, a case of know your place. The minimum task that I shouldn't be doing, I was sent to do them. I didn't query why I did them. But as I progressed, I realized that wasn't my task. I was given all the menial jobs. Um, uh, that kind of thing, you know. Um, I remember one officer um, sending me to um, work on the farm, you know, and I said to him, but I'm here to do nursing. He says, you'll get to that. <laughs> but I had to, you know, do all the menial jobs. Was, and I can give an example of when I was in Huddersfield. I was on a ward, and I'm sure the sister didn't like me. I wouldn't say because of my colour or whatever, I know she didn't. And every time something to be done that was domestically, she sent me to do it. We had assistant nurses at um, auxiliaries on the ward, but it's always my job to go and clean the cupboards out and go and do the menial task, instead of doing the medicine, what I'm trained to do. Um, right through to uh, I, when I was qualified, because I recall having been qualified with another then three or four or five nurses. Uh, we went to see the nursing, the senior nursing officer and said to him, now we are qualified, what are our chances of uh, getting promotion? I can tell you this in one instant. She said to me, would I go and clean the cupboards that have the children's food in it? That's what a children's ward. I said, okay, thank you. So I went and found the auxiliary. And I said to her, would you mind go and clean the cupboards out? The children fought with the food. So she went off and did that. She didn't like it. So she came and gave me the minimum, minimum task to do. So all I did was I wait until the auxiliary finished that. And I said, would you mind go and do the other task? And so therefore, um, I was just trying to give back what was given to me. And he made about two or three touches. Yeah, I don't know how my members are going to um, respond to taking orders from a black person, you know? And we saw the level of his discrimination. And um, to tell the truth, uh, within three weeks, most of the lads had left because they realized that their chances of promotion were zilch, you know? Uh, so they all left, you know. To tell you the truth, I was the only one who stayed around, mainly because that was what on the ducks back to me. Uh, I, 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 I tempered that with humor, and I've done that most of my, my, my nursing. When she realized that um, I was sticking up for myself, 
she complained and I had to go and see the metro, which I did. But I explained my situation. I'm saying to the matron, why is the auxiliary doing the medicine round? And I'm to clean a cupboard. Why should the auxiliary do the round with sister, with doctor, and I'm going to move a cot? I said, this one person who's not going to do that. So if you want to tell me to leave, you can tell me now because I'm not going to suit to that. And that was it. Widespread racism for the struggle for equality of opportunity of the African Caribbean workers challenged the unions. From the early formation in 1948 to the late 1970s, the NHS struggled to recognize African Caribbean workers, professionalism, and commitment to the service. Stories of racism were rife. What were the powers of redress for the African Caribbean workers to establish their employment rights? To deal with problems that emerge specifically around racism. Um, there's a feeling in, in, the, in, the, in the white dominated trade union movement in this period that, that picking up issues of race is going to be divisive, is going to be alienating to, um, alienating to their white members, um, and that, that therefore it's better to avoid dealing with those kinds of issues. Um, so um, throughout the 1970s, you'd, 70s, you'd find that these unions are um, have a, a disproportionately um, white dominated senior officers um, uh, and particularly they're dominated by men. There's some effort to redress this, but not a great deal. I was qualified as a nurse in 1966. I obtained my SRN, become a staff nurse. I work <clears throat> um, as a staff nurse for about six months. And then I got promotion to a nursing sister. My relationship with the NHS started about 1989 and it lasted for about approximately seven and a half years. Um, then I, as a nursing sister, um, I was in charge of units. Um, I did enjoy it in the first years. Um, it was very hard work, um, especially when I took on the role as the weekend cook. It uh, was a very pressured job um, from start to finish, um, but it was a role that um, I moulded to my own principles. Then I decided because my children needs their education and needs me at home, I'll do night duty instead of day duty. So I can be at home when they need me and when they're asleep, I'll be working. I can only um, refer to when I was working as a cook in the kitchen. Um, from the moment you came into the kitchen, you were always racing against the clock. Um, and it was a challenge each time to get 250 plus meals out on time and to a standard that was acceptable. I didn't face any challenges as such uh, with regards to me being from African descent. Um, I presume there was a bit of um, jealousy. As you know, we're, we're workers. Uh, so when we go to work, we work. And I did come up against uh, some jealousy in that respect, that I could come in, put my head down, get on with what I needed to do and produce what I produced. Um, but other than that, um, you know, I just kept myself to myself and got on with what I needed to do. You know, I became um, the nursing, the, the charge nurse on a ward that was Difficult. This is going to, this is stores all now. Right, back in 1981, I wasn't working at the time and I saw an advert asking for nurses to be recruited up at Stiles Hall. So I went along, I applied, we had like an entrance exam we had to take, which I passed. And from there, I set me on 
and as a pupil nurse back then. And the history of Stores Hall predated the NHS. It opened in 1904 to meet a demand for inpatient provision. Almost as soon as it was opened, it was full. It was a very busy hospital, but the management there always struggled to recruit staff. Built outside the town, it was difficult to get to. There were other better paid employment opportunities within commuting distance. And in some cases, its reputation meant that people would not consider it as an employment choice. To address this, the management team put on buses from the town and had recruitment drives in nearby towns. In the 1950s, in part of a wider trend within the NHS, those recruitment drives were extended to different parts of the world. This included Ireland, the West Indies, Mauritius, Ghana, parts of the Commonwealth. I became a qualified nurse at Stolzell Hospital. Yeah, um, it was a closed ward, it was a locked ward, it was a, a, a difficult ward. Behaviour problems maximum. Working at Stolzell was good. It was also hard work. You've got to bear in mind there were 49 wards when I first went up there and every ward was open so you can imagine how many staff, how many patients were there. But it was hard work, it was rewarding. I enjoyed it and we were family. You know, you work with a set of people who you get on with and it, it, was, good, it was good time. Myself and a colleague were two, were, were, were two people who they thought had uh, could could deal with that situation, and we did, you know, um, and that is how I got to that point of being a, a child nurse on that ward. By 1971, almost a quarter of staff at Stores Hall had been born outside the UK. This remains an often overlooked story in the history of mental health nursing. What we do know, however, is that local trade unions opposed in 1955 the arrival of 29 new nurses who hailed from Nigeria and Jamaica. Although unions denied that the hostility rested with a colour bar, questions were raised in Parliament and must have impacted on the reality of the new nurses' everyday working lives. But even then, the uh, discrimination and ra ra racism uh, showed its ugly head because um, I remember uh, the nursing officer was showing some dignitaries around and he told me that uh, he, these people were coming on the Monday, on, on the next week and I must, but he didn't tell me that I must stay in the background but it was obvious from what he did that I was not supposed to be the, spokes, the upfront spokesperson and from Stiles Hall, I transferred over to St Luke's Hospital, where, again, it was a different way of nursing as opposed to Stiles Hall. I think with St Luke's, it was more patients came in, you looked after them, they went home. At Stiles Hall, they were there permanently. There were no going home for them. And that, that was the difference. This was always a really full hospital that it had been built for something like 2,500 and it was regularly overcrowded. When we look at the figures in terms of staff patient ratios, they are always poor compared to other hospitals. So in terms of the, the everyday business of the hospital, you've got less staff looking after more patients than in other places. And this becomes an issue that is uh, recurrent across Stores Hall history and does lead to questions in Parliament. This is one of the reasons why they look to recruit abroad to try and bring those staff patient patients to more acceptable levels. There was one of the nurses that was there who was obviously um, Down syndrome. My form of it, but at the, at, when, when, when it came to the point of the, of the interview with his dignitary, this person was dressed in suits and things, and he was given some, some, some questions, some answers to questions that I would obviously answer, but he was probed, primed, I should say, 
to answer those on my behalf. For me, looking back now, when I were at Styles Hall, there was a lot of black people there working, but albeit they were nursing assistants, enrolled nurses, there were very few what I would call ward sisters, nurse, nursing officers, child nurses. In fact, I think there were only one black nursing officer at Styles Hall when, when I qualified. Um, most of the black, pe black workers were nursing assistants or enrolled nurses. Look at the history of Stars Hall. It seems to be very distant. It's very distant to people in the town. It seems far away. And yet what's happening in terms of its story is that that distance is expanded across the globe, that even though people from the town won't go and work there for whatever reason, of course, some do go and work there. But beyond that, we get people from coming from so many different parts of the world and just that challenge of making it across such vast expanses of ocean to get to this part of the West Riding of Yorkshire to then work in a place that has a reputation for being distant. It's just a fascinating story. I did experience discrimination at Stalls Hall and at St Luke's, mainly from some of the staff and from the patients. But I think with the patients, given that they've got mental health problems, you know, it was expected. But from some of the staff, it was done in such a subtle way, but it was very obvious that some staff were discriminated against the black people. And when it came to white promotions, we were very much overlooked, very much overlooked. <laughs> The wave of migration from 1948 to the late 1970s not only brought a vast and significant contribution to Britain's workforce. How did the NHS react to the specific health needs for growing African Caribbean and minority ethnic communities? African Caribbean uh people within the NHS as patients as opposed to as workers was also very complicated and complex. Um, the NHS would, uh, was a universal service designed to treat the, the concerns of the entire population, um, but certain uh, conditions like sickle cell anemia were specific and the NHS was not particularly geared up for that particular uh, group. It's, it's a blight on our community if it doesn't get addressed and we're talking about things like heart problems, type 1, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, prostate cancer, it's a, big, it's a big one, ulcers. Sickle cell has affected me majorly since I was 16, um, 1995-96 um, and the first experience was quite traumatic, I was in the intensive care unit. Um, it started off as the kidney infection, which ended up being um, an internal crisis, what's known as an internal crisis, so it affected my major organs internally. Research stems back to the 50s, the 60s and 70s particularly, which shows that disproportionate, um, the disproportionate figures in regards to African, African Caribbean, men in particular, being... Um, caught up becoming embroiled within the mental health um, service at the more critical end and um, quite um, um, and a lot of the time it's actually accessing it through the criminal justice system as well. My experience with the NHS has been really rocky um, because initially there was lack of understanding there was a lack of prompt care what I call prompt care as in um, sort of establishing where the pain is and believing us as well because we, we're not believed a lot of the times. A lot of these illnesses and disease is a blight on our community. There's been a lot of campaign and research done recently on prostate cancer and for some reason disproportionately a lot of black males 
suffer with this condition. And I think there needs to be a lot more research and more funding going into this particular area to uncover the rationale behind why so many black and Asian minority people suffer from these conditions. In other cases, we see um, that there are certain uh, kind of conditions which were more common to uh, particularly to African Caribbean men. Um, and the NHS is becoming concerned about those generally, uh, but they're not necessarily providing specific services to to African Caribbean men, or they're not adjusting the services in an appropriate way to ensure that, that those groups are, are seeking treatment. I think culture is really important. I'm thinking about things like mental health, for example, and uh, and how what is seen as mental illness is quite normal in a culture, because I know a lot of people they do tend to talk talk to themselves quite loudly and to them that is normal that's what happens but to the NHS then there's a problem uh, so that is just one example I can think of but when it comes to culture it's it's bound to have a bearing on behavior and behavior that one culture perceives as normal will be the same as another culture or something like prostate cancer, you know, they're targeted, um, the targeted advice is very, very limited. In fact, the advice generally is very limited until the 2000s uh, on that particular condition. Uh, and in other areas like diabetes uh, and mental health issues and high blood pressure, these things are only beginning to kind of become aware as the population of, of uh, African Caribbean migrants ages that these are particular problems that, that they seem to be experiencing more generally than the population as a whole, or that their experience of them is not uh, quite the same. Um, so the NHS is treating these issues, but it's not necessarily refining or uh, specific, specific enough in some of the ways in which they uh, target those, uh, those particular groups. I think the response to the Black and Asian minority community with COVID-19 has been, there's a degree of apathy going, going towards us. And I don't feel it has been taken seriously. And as a result, we have suffered greatly, disproportionately. The disparities in how many have died has not fully been addressed. And although research was done, it's I think it's been done staggered. And I don't think there was a, an, an urgency to address something that was quite critical at the time. So therefore, I think we, we suffered as a consequence. How do the Huddersfield Caribbean community feel about their contribution to the NHS as workers and also as a service? I think the National Health Service, service um, evolve at a greater extent with our presence. Um, we brought a sense of um, uh, a different type of care and compassion. Um, we were uh, a friendly type of person, people, um, got on well with people and so on, uh, and we blended well. We spoke English, so that helped. Uh, so um, it, it, it was not difficult to, um, to, to uh, blend and to contribute to changes where they were necessary. Um, I think also that um, the, uh, the, the, the people um, felt they needed to change. Some didn't, uh, some was quite hostile to us. But most of, most of us, most of us had a, uh, uh, not a difficult passage, you know, into the community or into the, into the world. The NHS, in its more than 70 years, uh, has developed incredibly from initially a service that was still focused overwhelmingly on providing care for sick people. 
uh, to one which now hopefully provides cures for people who uh, have specific illnesses that can be identified uh, and can be addressed. And within that, it has had to deal with an increasingly diverse population, one that is not just um, one that is divided by age and uh, gender and class, but also now increasingly by ethnicity uh, and by race. And so in undertaking those services, I think the NHS has tried to keep up with that changing population and is very much more aware uh, in the, the new millennium of the issues which are specific to, um, to, our, uh, my, um, to ethnic minority communities and to Caribbean communities. Um, but it still has a bit of work to do on this. Uh, and I think uh, the way in which particularly local services in the NHS, public health services as we're seeing with COVID, as these have been reduced, that opportunity to offer a more granular, specific, targeted uh, set of services uh, has been significantly different. I was quite proud uh, when I got the job uh, to say that I worked at the Huddersfield Royal Infirmary. The, the, the care within the NHS I would say has become very, um, ne from then to now, it's still not changed much, it's still not improved much in the fact of the knowledge that these practitioners should have and do have. We're in the age of information now, so they should know a lot more than what they do. And I feel I'm more, um, I trust more to stay at home and deal with my crisis now than going to hospital. Well, I started in 1981 at Stiles Hall, and yeah, it was hard work, it was good times, but over the years, it moved from caring into like a business. It, it became a business, there were targets you had to meet, targets you had to meet, you know, performances you had to meet. And it kind of went away from caring for sick and mentally health patients to We've got to save money here, we've got to save money here. The NHS is a great organisation. It is, we're very thankful that we have such an organisation in our country, um, you know, and I have not had any issues at all um, health wise. If I've gone to my GP, raised an issue, it has been referred and it has been dealt with. And I think I speak for the majority of people. Um, I've never heard of any issues that hasn't been dealt with or someone that has suffered uh, the consequences of it not being dealt with. Afro-Caribbean people who are living in this country, so therefore if they don't take on board what affects them more, more then they'll be behind with treatment for them. It's Massive strength is the fact that it is universal and it is free at the point of delivery and it's tax funded. The problem with that is that we all therefore expect the best service from this. We all expect the same and the best service because it is universal. So you end up with a situation, postcode lotteries, where a service isn't equal in one community to another. People are upset about that or they don't, it doesn't serve one community as effectively as another in terms of their background, their demographics, or they don't serve illnesses effectively one across another. So, you know, some illnesses are seen as being privileged, whereas others are seen as being left behind in the system. Uh, but that universality is so, it means that it's both its benefit and its, and its cost. It's the thing that we love about it, but also the thing that makes us most angry. Um, I think health service do try to um, look at how these um, diagnoses can be um, treated and also try to find out from the Caribbean people what can help in making their lives or their health better. On one side, it isn't as broad as it ought to be but there's a bit of help. You have to look for it, you have to find it, you might have to go distance to get it. But if you are keen enough, you can get help, health-wise.